I think we're good to go again. Here we are, Unit 2, second video with a variety of other video supports um, that will be on the website for you to look at. So we're going to talk about types of chemical bonds and some of the things associated with chemical bonds. First of all, let's talk about hydrogen bonds. It primarily is important uh, in how organic, the shape of organic molecules, uh, how they fold upon each other, and, and how hydrogen bonds, uh, the positive and negative poles, or parts of those molecules attract each other, so they help determine the shape of large organic molecules. But they also are important in water because water is made up of two ions or two atoms, so hydrogen of course as you know and, and oxygen. Oxygen is a large molecule compared to hydrogen. So what happens is the hydrogens are attached covalently to the oxygen atom but they tend to be off to one side because the negative charge on oxygen tends to pull hard on the electrons that it's getting and sharing with uh, that it's sharing with with the hydrogen and so uh, since oxygen is so big it, it uh, sort of shares more it gets the bigger share so it's more negative on the side opposite of where the hydrogens are attached to. So one end of water tends to be negative and one tends to be positive. So it's polar. Uh, it's not uniformly charged. It is charged uh, negative and positive, um, sort of like a magnet. And that's why water is sticky. So if you pour water out of a glass, all of the molecules of water follow the leader because they're sort of stuck together by a weak hydrogen bond. And this is why water is also known as the universal solvent, because it is polar. It has the ability to dissolve almost everything else eventually. Some things like salt or sugar might dissolve very rapidly in water. Other things like iron and steel and metals uh, may take a long, long time to oxidize and dissolve, but they will and rocks dissolve and water is a serious agent of erosion. If you'll notice the drip line comes off your garage onto the cement floor in front of your garage or cement uh, driveway in front of your garage, you'll notice that little by little the water is eating away at the substance of your driveway. Okay, ionic bonds. These are when atoms are attracted by their opposite charges. Uh, you know, when we looked at the table of elements, we noticed that some of these, uh, these important uh, ions, sodium, magnesium, potassium, and calcium, those are important ions in our body. But in a crystal form, they're attached, these are positive, and they're attached to negatives over here. Sodium chloride, for example potassium chloride, for example. So in water or in a fluid, these ions or these crystals dissociate and we end up with these free-floating ions in our fluids in our body. And they're important because sodium, potassium, Calcium and magnesium are important ions that make up your body, particularly the hydroxyapatite of your bone. And physiologically, sodium, potassium, and calcium are essential for action potential propagation down axons. And calcium is absolutely essential for transmission of action potentials across the synapses of nerves into muscle sarcomeres. Heart attack is a foregone conclusion of low blood calcium levels. There are, other, uh, so, uh, there are other medical conditions associated with 
high and low levels of sodium and potassium, water retention problems, and so forth. So these are very important. But these are relatively weak bonds, so these ions, which are important in your physiological functions, do uh, dissociate in water, and so a negative sodium ion is surrounded, or a positive sodium ion, I'm sorry, is surrounded by the negative poles of water molecules. And the negative chlorine that it might have been attached to, sodium chloride, right, is surrounded by the positive ends of water molecules. And so when you get a glass of water that's saturated with salt or sugar or whatever, it's because the ions that have been made by dissociation from the crystals of salt or sugar have completely used up all of the water molecules that could surround them. And there's no more space left. So they just precipitate out and stay in the bottom of the glass. Um, and, and that's what you're actually seeing. Here. So there is a physical chemical relationship between ions and the fluid that they're in um, and the chemical makeup. And of course water being polar uh, is pretty simple to explain. Then we have covalent ions. No, not ions. Covalent bonds. What is covalent bonds? Covalent bonds are the strongest bonds there are. They're associated with most of our organic macro macromolecules and uh, they're the way that they're synthesized. And they basically uh, are from the sharing of electrons. Now remember that electrons exist yeah, here we go, in different shells. Well, each of these shells of an atom wants to be full. So if we have an atom that, let's say, this shell is lacking two electrons, it has room, it wants to grab two more to be stable. And then we have another uh, atom, perhaps, that has a shell, instead of having eight electrons in it, or six, needing two, it has only two. So if it gets rid of those two, then then it drops down to the more stable shell, which is full below it. So what happens is these two combine, like sodium chloride, uh, wood and ionically, but in this case they share the electrons, and that's a very strong bond. And this is the way most of your organic ion, uh, organic atoms are made. Organic molecules are made, I'm sorry. And what kind of molecules are there? There's carbohydrates, which is the food that, of the body. It's the primary, primary energy source. We can get energy from other macromolecules, however, but carbohydrates are generally sugars is what we burn. And in order to get energy from the other macromolecules, we have to tear them apart and make sugars out of them. Fats are long chain carbons, longer chain than carbohydrates. You know, carbohydrates are not just sugar, they may be starches also, and they may be complex starches, so that there are not all, you know, every starch isn't a potato starch, every starch isn't uh, a complex sugar like, um, oh, I don't know, let's compare a couple. Uh, potato starch is pretty digestible. We can cook a potato and, by gosh, we break it down pretty rapidly. But let's take cellulose which is a long-chain carbohydrate that makes up the walls of plant cells. Um, that creates, a, that's a fiber, and that fiber is pretty hard for us to digest, but it's also basically a carbohydrate. It certainly isn't a fat. Fats uh, are for storing energy in the body, and sometimes they're for making a little padding too. Sometimes adipose tissue or fat tissue uh, is underneath the base of skin. Uh, sometimes it surrounds organs and it helps to protect them. So fat isn't only functioning as storage of energy, but it functions also as uh, padding. And that padding is not such a bad thing if we fall down on hard ground. Okay, when you look in the mirror, 
almost everything you see is protein. Your structure and regulation of function, that is enzymes, are proteins. Um, unfortunately, proteins are really, really affected by temperature and pH. You know, the structure of enzymes um, is determines function. There are two kinds of proteins in your body. There are structural proteins that make up the matrix of your bone and your muscles and so forth. But there's also enzymatic proteins which regulate the activities of your body. When you get sick, your body raises its temperature. In response to foreign invaders, your hypothalamus tells your cells, you gotta dump ATP fast and raise the temperature. The purpose is to denature the enzymes of the invaders so that they're easier to kill. Now fortunately it's harder to denature our enzymes usually than it is to denature the invaders enzymes. So while we're denaturing the invaders enzymes, ours are being damaged and we don't feel well. And we don't feel well because the processes of our body are not operating properly. But this is one way that we fight against infections of the invaders that get inside of us. Proteins are made by direction from DNA in cooperation with ribosomal RNA and messenger RNA and transfer RNA. Uh, which work together in a little factory on the ribosomes in the cells to string amino acids together. And then those amino acids are working together to, um, well, the long string of amino acids works to fold up in response to pH and temperature conditions to become a certain structure, like uh, a part of a jigsaw puzzle, and that structure determines whether that amino acid is going to do its job right. Okay. Finally, um, we have nucleic acids which are used to make DNA and the three types of RNA. DNA has the code of you, who you are and what you look like. A lot of you is made of nucleic acids. So what I'd like you to do is take a look at the video that's attached down here. Uh, you can look at these directions. You can even do this at home if you'd like. It's real easy to do. And if you extract DNA and see how much you get from a couple of strawberries, you will understand how much DNA you are made of. It's a lot. And uh, it's a very specific uh, kind of molecule that uh, carries our code. It's what we are. And there are quite a few videos that you can watch to understand uh, what DNA is, what its structure is, and how it works. But basically, DNA is going to have a message to send into the cell using messenger RNA. It will take that message, and that's called transcription, to the ribosomes, made of ribosomal RNA, and then transfer RNA that's floating around in the cytoplasm will bring in the amino acids in proper sequence to construct that protein. And those proteins will either be structural proteins or functional proteins. They will build your body, and they will regulate all of its activities. The ones that regulate those activities are called enzymes, and we mentioned them above when we were talking about proteins. Okay, enjoy the videos. If you have any questions, be sure to send emails. I'll send another discussion briefly, uh, and I'll attach to this, that discusses what, what pH is and how it affects enzymes also.